Hi, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Some Soothings. This is Season 2, Episode 5. My name is Joshua. Uh, I am a musician and glitch and sound artist, and Some Soothings is a 30-minute weekly live stream. I'll share and discuss art and poetry and music and history. Um, there'll be occasional jokes. Um, there'll be a lot of earnestness. Uh, there'll be some live improvised music. It's an outlet. Um, it's a place for me to work out ideas and hopefully, you know, even though there's a screen between us, hopefully connect a little bit with y'all. Um, we'll never to be really gentle, um, really vulnerable, calming if we can be. But we're taking a broad definition of the word soothing. Um, we will not be ignoring any of the seriousnesses of our current moment. So, welcome. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, some quick housekeeping. We have been just wildly struggling with the stability of the Instagram Live platform, so we'll just see how tonight goes, fingers crossed. Um, we're archiving these episodes on in the IGTV that's in my profile, so I'll just try to get this show up as quick as I can in case the stream goes wacky. Um, if you want to learn more about anything that we talk about on the show, there is a link to an info doc um, in the pinned comment. Uh, I can't really read the comments, it's sort of, I can sort of see what's going on over here, but not in any real discernible way. But I am recording them, um, so I will check them out later when I'm drinking my nightly glass of coconut milk. And I'll respond to like any questions or comments at the top of next week's show. Alright, gang, thank you for sticking with us, thank you for hanging with us. Um, let's get going, let's look at some art. Let's So this is Red Stripe Kitchen by Martha Rosler. Uh, it's a photo montage from 1972. Rosler was born in Brooklyn in 1943 and still lives here in New York, uh, in Greenpoint, in Brooklyn, uh, today, uh, now aged 77. Um, Rosler trained at Brooklyn College and then went west to UC San Diego, uh, then came back east and, and Rosler was just like an institution at Rutgers University, um, taught there for like 30 plus years, uh, and they still continue to lecture and, and they serve in like an advisory capacity to New York museums like the Whitney and MoMA. Um, Rosler has published 16 books of photography, art, and criticism. Their work has been collected and shown everywhere, MoMA, Whitney, Met, New Museum, Jewish Museum, Tate, uh, Art Institute Chicago, um, everywhere. Uh, you've likely seen Rosler's work before. Um, Rosler has a broad curiosity, uh, you know, obviously evidenced in, the, in this like career, this academic career in teaching and writing, um, but also has just this like wildly multidisciplinary visual art practice. So the work in photography and collage, in video and in sculpture, performance and installation. And the work is often overtly political. Um, engaging with with feminism, with mass media, with with war, with late capital, with homelessness. Um, Red Strip Kitchen is a photo montage responding to the American military engagement uh, in the Vietnam War. Oh, um, photo montage. The photo montage is simply the collaging of different photographic sources together and then um, re-photographing them. So, in that process it allows the artist to like do new filtering and color manipulation and then other like photo processing effects. Um, it's often employed I think as is evidenced here to create like a kind of seamlessness or a sense that the um, that the image is not like like a composite not a reconstruct. Um, it's sort of like uh, pre-digital photoshopping um, but the process I guess is way different um, because it's, it's, it's physical, there's a materiality to the photo montage process. Um, anyway, this work is part of a multi-year series that's created from 1967 to 1972. Um, and Rosler collects all of these under the title, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home. Um, and the entire series juxtaposes like either the suggestion or, or like a really direct representation of, of war making. Um, but inserts it into these like really like bucolic scenes of suburban domesticity. Um, like for me, and this this piece in particular, like just really evokes um, Edward Hopper's like very famous covers of the Saturday Evening Post. Um, there's a nostalgia. There's there's an evocation of nostalgia and suburbia. Um, 
and of course also this evocation of this direct reference to these like I don't know pretty hammy like consumer women's checkout aisle magazines um, which I think that this this image the the one of the main the main aspect of this image I think is drawn from uh, from a house beautiful um, so this stuff until it was this is amazing so until this stuff was professionally printed much later in the artist's career um, as many as like 20 or 30 years later uh, most of this work was primarily distributed as photocopied flyers um, or like uh, zines or underground newspapers that were handed out at anti-war marches um, which I just find so remarkable and just very cool um, I think partly I find it really cool is because I personally am thinking a lot right now about like what my own relationship is between making art, uh, promoting and distributing that art, um, and, and doing activist work. Um, thinking a lot about prioritizing urgencies and specifically how like agitprop can play a role in my own practice. Um, agitprop is just the word that we use for like art or literature and theater that has like a really overt political agenda. Um, I, th I think the word comes into existence to fill this space between like propaganda, which is really ham-fisted, um, and so I think like agitprop is like maybe more nuanced and poetical, uh, but it still has this agitating, that's the first part of the words, agitation for uh, political change um, built into it, so, anyway, so that's agitprop. So I've been thinking about agitprop in my own practice, um, and Rouser's like whole career, and this House Beautiful series like specifically, um, it's just like a model, just like a really deft example of how to like move through the art world, make work that is activist-minded, that is artistic, that is agitprop, that's educational. Um, so I went hunting um, for like more of Rosler's thoughts on this topic, so let me just share like a run of quotes here. These, this, is all in, this is all things that Martha Rosler has written or, or said. Um, so quote, I like to bring issues which are relatively abstract down to the level of the personal. People change the world, not art. But art can help in that effort. Artists can do things that make a difference. Quote, art provides a different frame for interpreting experience and offers the possibility of intelligible political engagement. Quote, the artistic imagination dreams of historical agency. Artists wish to lend themselves to social transformation and utopian dreaming. So let's unpack that last one a little bit because this feels compelling and really useful to me. So um, Adrienne Marie Brown says the first step of all radical organizing is an act of science fiction, um, which I think is so clever. So Brown says we have to be able to like, imagine the future that we agitate for, that we desire, that we are uh, engaging, um, or that we're directing our engagement towards. So it's an act of speculative or science fiction. Um, and I think how Rosler contributes to that conversation. I think Rosler would, would would consider that like an artwork itself can do that imagining, like the artwork can depict that future. Um, Brown cites Octavia Butler as an example of that. I think Rosler in this work is sort of doing that, right? Depicting a, a possible future. Um, but I think Rosler in their writing discusses this concept and I think it's an important, although albeit nuanced one, um, that artwork may also just simply encourage the viewer to open new pathways in their imagination so that the work doesn't necessarily have to articulate the future but it but in order to be good activist or edge proper or, or good activist minded artwork um, agitating work it doesn't have to depict that future but it has to help a viewer on their own journey to depicting a future um, I mean, when I just said that out loud, it didn't sound like it made a lot of sense. But I think the, I think that that's the idea that, um, I guess, like pulling back the curtain or, or, or uh, hel helping the viewer see through the veil, um, and then the viewer can continue on their journey, is a way that art can activate activists. All of which seems really interesting to me. That seems very interesting to me, and, and possibly like a way forward, maybe in my own work. Um, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, I also really want to spend a second and just like inhale and hold um, Rosler's phrase, utopian dreaming, for a moment. Because um, I want to do more of that. Um, it's like whomever is responsible for my night times, um, please take a note. 
less anxiety dreams about spreadsheets and uh, forgetting my mask at the grocery, more utopian dreaming over here. Please. Martha Rosler, everybody. Um, digging through these interviews and through Rosler's published writing was like really a pleasure. Um, they're super brilliant, super articulate, and just really generous of spirit. Um, I think decades of teaching undergrads probably make you really smart. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you all to go digging. Um, there's more info in our info doc. Also, before we move on from art stuff, um, I have a couple follow-ups from past shows. So a bunch of artists, including some soothings, like deep favorite, Wageshi Mutu, um, they've created these like social media friendly original artworks for this Get Out the Vote initiative called Plan Your Vote. Um, it's cool stuff. Uh, you can like download these images, share them, encourage your like art friends to participate in the electoral process. Um, so that's planyourvote.org, uh, all one word. Um, looks like for the, the .org part, that's after. You know what I meant. Uh, and there's a link in the doc. Also, early in season one of Some Sea Things, we had a really brief discussion about the, um, I don't know, rumors is not the right word, like the kind of like back channel chatter about systemic issues facing black folk and POC at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, and that's kind of coming to a head lately. There's a group of anonymous staff persons and former staff persons that are sharing their experiences and asking for accountability in Guggenheim leadership. So I would really encourage you all to follow A Better Guggenheim on Instagram. Um, that's a bet, this is all one word, A Better Guggenheim is G-U-G-G-E-N-H-E-I-M, A Better Guggenheim, all one word. And there's a link in the doc to this, but it's really interesting. They are um, agitating for more accountability, accountability in Guggenheim leadership. Um, it's good stuff. All right, up next we have a new segment on the show called Ask Yourself. Uh, a few weeks ago I wrote up a bunch of, frankly, kind of like combative questions, um, and then I wrote a little piece of code that sort of randomizes them, so I don't know what question we're going to get tonight. Um, and so I will ask myself the question and, and try to answer it to the best of my ability. I don't know, maybe it can serve like as a prompt for you as well. So um, let's see what we get here. Ask yourself. Oh boy. Um, okay. Uh, hey friend, uh, what, what tendencies are harming you? Ooh, um, wow. Thanks for asking. Um, well, I could probably stand to do like less uh, unpacking the minutia of failed romantic relationships um, from my past, that probably isn't doing me a lot of good. Um, that, would be a, that would be a tendency that I have that maybe is doing me harm. Um, another one that kind of comes to mind is the way I, I do like systems of like reward structures for myself. Um, I think we maybe all do a version of this, right, where we like allow ourselves, uh, grant ourselves, like, permission to do things as a reward for doing something that's a bummer. Um, but I think I'm not doing that that well, uh, or I have a tendency to do that poorly. So let me give, like, a, an example really quick to you. Um, although you already know this because I'm talking to myself. You're me also. But I'm going to give you this example anyway. Um, going to the grocery store, as we both know, is really unpleasant um, still because of like COVID times. Uh, even maybe in regular times, the grocery store isn't that fun. Um, but in particular right now, the grocery store is really a bummer. So one of the things that I have been doing is letting myself like get a special treat at the grocery store. So like some processed sugar vegan cupcake or like a bag of experimentally flavored potato chips. Um, and you know, I'll go grocery shopping, um, it, which will take a really long time. It'll be really unpleasant. And then I'll bring everything home and then I'll disinfect everything. And the whole while, like, you know, knowing that I have this reward at the end of it, and then I binge on it. I just like eat gross chips or like weird processed vegan weirdness. And then I feel really horrible. Um, 
partly because eating gross things is gross, but then also I just sort of feel horrible because putting like gross stuff in your body makes your body not feel good. Um, so the whole like reward thing is sort of broken, but I keep doing it. Uh, you and I have been doing this for this entire pandemic, every time we go grocery shopping, every two to three weeks. So that seems like a tendency that we should address, how we are using reward and binge. Um, I think that's all I got. Wow, well thank you for being, uh, for that thoughtful response. That's a weird segment, everybody. Uh, I kind of like it. Um, up next, we have Radical History Snacks, uh, which either features like cool old food or highlights a moment in the people's history. So from 1967 to 1973, the U.S. Armed Forces conscripted 2.2 million young American men to serve in the Vietnam War effort. Approximately 100,000 draftees fled the country, and approximately 170,000 applied for conscientious objector status. The military, uh, as far as I can tell, like for as long as we've recorded history, like relishes like symbolism and theatricality and protocol. Um, and the idea is like somehow like if, if a violence is cloaked in conceits of like structure and pageantry, that violence is somehow like deemed necessary or, or like even heroic somehow. Um, but what's so janky about that is it's only that way because it's been artificially systematized and romanticized. So um, it's like recursive. I don't know. Anyway, on April 28th, uh, 1967, at the Armed Forces Examining and Entrance Station in Houston, Texas, uh, an army lieutenant presides over the ceremony inducting new draftees. Uh, so to a room full of 19 to 25 year olds, he says, quote, you'll take one step forward as your name is called and such step will constitute your induction into the armed forces. And so as he rattles off names uh, and young men step to attention and they cross this like symbolic threshold from civilian to soldier, uh, that is except for one man. Um, and there's some confusion uh, because there's two names on his draft card. Uh, so the lieutenant calls out again, uh, Clay, Cassius, Cassius Clay, Ali, Muhammad Ali. But the world heavyweight boxing champion refuses to budge. Ali is, arrest is arrested for refusing conscription, for refusing to serve, refusing to even be inducted, um, and applies for conscientious objector status. Um, Ali says, Quote, this is a long quote. Everybody ready? Here we go. Quote, I'm not going 10,000 miles from home to help murder and burn another poor nation simply to continue the dominance of white slave masters of the darker people the world over. If I thought the war was going to bring freedom and equality to 22 million of my people, they wouldn't have to draft me. I'd join tomorrow. My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother or some darker people or some poor hungry people in the mud for big, powerful America. And shoot them for what? They never called me the N-word. They never lynched me. They didn't put dogs on me. They didn't rob me of my nationality, rape and kill my mother and father. Shoot them for what? How can I shoot them poor people? Just take me to jail. Whew. Man, the champ had a way with words. Um, Ali is denied conscientious objector status uh, and is found guilty by an all-white jury of draft evasion. The World Boxing Association strips him of his title and he is banned from the ring, from fighting altogether, um, in, uh, globally. Um, and because he is, uh, because his case is working his way through the judicial system, um, he can't leave the states either. Uh, so this is 1967. Um, there's already substantial grassroots opposition to the Vietnam War, of course, right? But... Ali is just this, this like wildly popular national figure, um, like at the apex of his career. And I think like through this defiant act, it, it brings like the anti-war and anti-racism message into American homes in this really profound way that it might not have otherwise. Um, and in doing so, Ali gives up everything. I mean, he posts bail and appeals the decision. 
uh, over the next four years, it winds its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, four years. So four years, not in the ring. Um, and that's like a you know pivotal four years here in the States. So, you know, the um, American popular support for the engagement in Vietnam had waned by then. Uh, by the early 70s, over half of American citizens believed the war was, was wrong and immoral. Um, so then in 1971, the Supreme Court overturns Ali's conviction. Um, Ali returns to the ring and in 1974 defeats George Foreman to retake the title of heavyweight champion of the world. So that's our snack. Uh, Muhammad Ali, like his most costly and most profound and meaningful victory is like the champ versus the draft board, Cassius Clay versus an unjust war, Muhammad Ali versus the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, it's a beautiful moment of like sport and protest. Uh, okay, more info in the info doc. Um, up next we have our Some Smooth Soothing special feature. All right, buckle up everybody. We got a good special feature today. This is Beats and Beats featuring the Winstons. So each week on some see things, we take a brief look at organizations or, or an organizer that's doing work that we admire. I will have already researched and donated to that org and in sharing it with y'all, um, you know, I'm encouraging you to consider a donation as well if, if you are able. So, so this week we are looking at the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, the American Friends Service Committee is a Quaker organization devoted to, quote, service development and peace programs throughout the world. Um, Quakers are the old school conscientious objectors. Um, and just like a really quick point of clarification, the Quakers are not the Amish and they are not the Shakers. Uh, there's no buggies and bonnets and reactionary conservatism here. Um, Quakers are a modern faith uh, whose kind of fundamental, I guess arguably, but, but I think their most fundamental belief is this like steadfast commitment to justice through pacifism. So historically, that's led the Quakers to be active abolitionists. They were uh, participants in the Underground Railroad. Um, Quakers have fought for women's rights, better prison conditions, for international geopolitical peace, um, anti-nuclear pl proliferation. Um, since 1917, the American Friends Service Committee has represented the activist wing of the Quaker faith tradition. Um, so major efforts by the Friends Service Committee include Defending immigrant rights, uh, human rights monitoring, humanitarian relief, ending mass incarceration, defunding the police, lobbying for uh, reduced federal military budget, um, and recently organize, organization and participation in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Um, I have a lot of love for the Friends. Um, I personally received uh, nonviolent civil disobedience training from an American Friends Service Committee um, coalition uh, many years ago. Um, I think that they are just lovely, let, you know, let me just read this. Let me read this in their own words, and, and I think you'll see what I mean. Um, the American Friends Service Committee seeks, quote, a just, peaceful, and sustainable world free of violence, inequality, and oppression. We respect the equality, worth, and dignity of all people and regard no one as our enemy. We seek right relationship with all life on a sustainable earth. We accept that our understanding of truth is incomplete and seek ever deeper insights from the lived experience. We trust the spirit to guide discernment of our collective actions. We assert the transforming power of love and active nonviolence as a force for justice and reconciliation. 
Mm. I love it. Uh, so I, you know, I don't consider myself a person of faith exactly, you know, personally, but I do have like a, just a really profound admiration for those who affect their spirituality in, in the world like this. Um, you know, the Quakers are creating community justice and, and, and equality and freedom. Um, and there's, let me, I'm going to read one more quote here, uh, because I think that it, um, is relevant, uh, whether you're a spiritual or a person of faith or not. Um, uh, this is from the UN delegate, uh, the Quakers UN delegate, delegate to the United Nations. Um, so quote, uh, we carry our conviction in the ordinary detail of our lives. And I just love that. Um, may we all carry our convictions into the ordinary detail of our lives. Um, so American Friends Service Committee, uh, donate link is in the pinned comment um, below. Uh, they're doing great stuff. Okay, music time. How are we doing? Oh boy, I've been talking a lot today, huh? Uh, okay, we're just going to do like a really quick, let's do like three or four minutes of some, you know, live improvised um, electronic music. Uh, so, okay, here it comes.
All right. Uh, cool. Um, thank you for listening. Let's uh, close with a poem. So this is Rune's Library by Myung Mi Kim. Where the route of a ship bringing tax grain from the provinces is described. Where perceived hindering, say, birds congregating on a highway. Where the first request was for fertilizer and seed. Where the instruction, harness these to the benefit of your society. where the conscription continued, where boards of revenue, where basically everyone had a plant job, where preventable diseases rampant, where the need is window screens and sewer covers, where for the good of the very few and the suffering of a great many. All right, gang, that's our show. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend a bit of Sunday evening with you. Um, see you next week. Take good care of each other. Uh, take good care of yourselves. Good night.